Okay, and there's Jane, and I don't see if we have Heidi. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and, and get started, and hopefully she will join us at some point. So right now we just have Joe Plensler and Jane Turner. And one of the, one of the things I thought um, that I made this a two-part panel because I thought there's different ways we tell our story and that there's healing in storytelling. Now, this is especially true for whistleblowers who have been victims of gaslighting, bullying, counter-accusing. They have had their judgment and motives questions, which can lead to self-doubt and loss of confidence. Therefore, it's important for them to own their own narrative, as we like to say, about the wrongdoing that they witnessed and the way in which the retaliation has impacted them personally. And I think we were talking a little bit earlier about what makes somebody feel triggered. Well, being able to talk about those things and how you talk about them can be very personal and very powerful. So, and they may do this through social media or by working with a professional journalist who can help shape and record their story for public release. This can be important aspects of informing the public about the corruption and the harmful activities and the organizational cover-ups. Um, this isn't really a conference about the fraud and the wrongdoing, it's really more about the, re the retaliation and the healing, but we could easily spend all day talking about the different aspects of corruption and fraud. But whistleblowers usually want to get those stories out into the public because they know that those stories are important and they want people to know that there's harm being perpetrated there, their water may be contaminated or their patient care not appropriate. So they want their stories out in the public domain. They wanna see that public pressure for action that needs to be taken to mitigate the harm that's being done. But understanding how to tell your story and knowing how to engage um, formal or informal media sources is important. And so this can be done either with an exclusive to one source or parsed out to multiple sources. Um, at this point, I've been interviewed by lots of different people. And so you just need to know how to be prepared and how to work with, whether it's TV, radio, um, print media, what are some of the rules of engagement that you need to know? And how do you need to be emotionally prepared for that? Um, and then of course, uh, is there any kind of liability for telling your story? Are you releasing national security information or proprietary information? Um, so I think those are the, the, some of the things I was hoping that we can discuss during this panel. Um, so I'm gonna ask uh, Jane and Joe, if you wouldn't mind, Jane, Joe, and Jackie, this should be easy, to, um, to first tell us a little bit about yourself and your whistleblowing experience and then um, we'll go into some more about working with the media. Uh, so ladies first, <laughs> Jane, why don't you tell me a little bit uh, or tell us, I, I mean, I think most, most of the world knows who you are, but why don't you give us a little bit about your background and um, what you do? Okay, uh, right now I am a journalist for the Whistleblower Network News also a podcaster and a definite advocate for whistleblowers throughout the world. Um, my whistleblower journey started 20, over 20 years ago. And it was when I reported on misconduct, malfeasance, and a cover-up by uh, an agent up in North Dakota concerning crimes against children. Uh, I was out of service for uh, a long time. I uh, refer to being in the wilderness for 10 years because uh, back then they did not have any uh, anything set up where you could talk to anyone or have fellow whistleblowers. And the only one I had was Fred Whitehurst who was of the FBI lab scandal fame. And he got a hold of me and he talked me off the ledge more times than I can count. Um, I was devastated with how the FBI handled my bringing to light to the malfeasance and misconduct. 
Uh, the FBI was my identity. It was everything that I wanted from when I was young. And so when they kicked me out the door, I lost my tribe. I lost everything. And it devastated me. So um, what happened was um, when Whistleblower Network News started, um, and they asked me to be a journalist, I jumped on board, and it has been very soul-satisfying, not only to all the whistleblowers I have interviewed, but also to myself, because in a lot of the stories, I see the same dynamics uh, happening as what happened in my case. So that helps a lot in knowing that you're not just the victim. Uh, there's a lot of victims and you share a lot of things in common. Um, I'm closing in on over 60 whistleblowers I've interviewed. Their stories are in uh, the Whistleblower Network News. And I'm very careful uh, to put down their narrative, not a narrative as part of a big newspaper that I think our readers would like, uh, but their narrative in their words. And I think that's very helpful to a whistleblower, first of all, to be acknowledged, second, to get uh, the coverage, and third, to be able to talk to uh, other whistleblowers. And as you know, I've referred some to you, Jackie, mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. your organization is uh, very, very good at kind of helping whistleblowers who, uh, like me, were are totally devastated. Um, and so your service is really, really great. And I also have to be really careful, like you mentioned, uh, the last one I did was Dr. Sowers, the FinCEN uh, uh, whistleblower who released the IRS financial data uh, into the world which revealed that uh, President Trump was colluding with Russia. It was a very, very big story. But one thing I always remember with whistleblowers is not to hurt them in the interview. It's not about me. It's not about, you know, my presence being heightened. It's about presenting their story, but not hurting them. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Sowers was part of the CIA, and so I had to be very careful in presenting her story that I didn't hurt her in that aspect or reveal something that would add to her prison time. So uh, uh, making sure you're helping the whistleblower and not hurting them is uh, very important. Yeah. So I appreciate your ability to bring us to the forefront here. And uh, I, I'm honored to be with this panel, uh, with the rest of these uh, panelists. So, Joe, your, your, your perspective is a little different. Why don't you introduce yourself and uh, the story? And I think you have that family member story. I don't know if you've heard, but um, most of the day today, everybody has kind of talked about how there's been an impact on the family and, you know, how you have to talk to your family and involve your family. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your story and then we'll we'll get into some of the, the what you really know how to do. Yeah, sure. No, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Jackie, for inviting me to participate today. And congratulations. This is an incredible conference. And I've been able to tune into most of it today in between client work. I've had you <laughs> kind of running in the background the whole time. <laughs> Uh, my name is Joe Plunzler. I'm a retired Marine Corps officer. I'm a whistleblower ally, uh, and I, now with my partner, I own my own consulting company, Cassandra Hellenist Partners. Um, around 2014 to 2015, a client of mine uncovered 40 years of data confirming gender bias in the recruiting and training of women in the Marine Corps. And despite making historic improvements to female performance at boot camp, um, my client led the, all, the only all-female unit in the Department of Defense, which was the Recruit Training Battalion over at uh, Paris Island, 4th Recruit Training Battalion. Um, despite many, making uh, historic improvements to female performance, uh, when she became vocal about the fixes and the disparities, uh, the generals fired her from command and uh, sent her packing. And what was at stake at the time was that the Marine Corps, that was happening down in, in Paris Island, South Carolina, but up on Capitol Hill was a huge debate with, uh, uh, between the Obama administration and uh, elements within the Department of Defense as far as uh, 
who should be allowed to do what within the military, essentially. And the Marine Corps, uh, being the, the rusty dragging boat anchor on, uh, of change in the Department of Defense, uh, wanted to keep sex-based discriminatory policies against women in place, right? To preserve ground combat jobs of infantry, artillery, tanks, and things like that uh, as a men-only domain. So it didn't matter whether the women could do the job, they just wanted it to be all men for cultural reasons. And, um, you know, I wrote a short article a couple years ago about what we learned from this experience in government executive titled Eight Lessons from Taking on the Government and Winning. Uh, my client ended up writing a book about our experiences called Fight Like a Girl, The Truth Behind How Female Marines Are Trained, which was published in 2018. Um, and uh, the beauty of it is uh, I had just uh, my last five years in, in uniform, I had served in the Pentagon. Um, for three successive commandants of the Marine Corps. So I was pretty intimately um, involved with the Pentagon Press Corps and had a lot of contacts. So I had retired from the Marine Corps just as this was starting to bubble up. And uh, I was able to really leverage those relationships with the press um, to really start what became a three-year public pressure campaign to get the Marine Corps to change these policies. And, you know, we, we kind of walked the same dark valley that that many whistleblowers have have expressed um you know i think the that was probably the lowest i've ever seen my client um second only to when her mother died in 2009 and um and there were times where i'd be talking to her down to south carolina saying i need you to tell me you're okay or else i'm getting in the car and i'll i'll, I'll be down there in eight hours like it was that um that bad of of just i mean y'all have had been through it so uh, you know i can appreciate um, having seen it in, um, in my client. And uh, there were some wins. So on December 3rd, 2015, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter opened all ground combat jobs to women. Uh, the Marine Corps continued to train women in a segregated environment at Paris Island. Uh, March 17, 2017, uh, the Marine Corps produced its first female infantry Marine, a woman named Maria Dom, who uh, she was super, super tough. I mean, literally, I'm not kidding. Uh, was born in a Siberian prison camp and emigrated to the United States and became a U.S. citizen and then and joined the Marine Corps. A tough, tough uh, young woman. Uh, September 2017, they produced the first female infantry officer, uh, First Lieutenant Marina Hurl. And then in the 2020 National Defense Authorization Act, Congress ordered the Marine Corps to fully integrate women into its training battalions, both at Paris Island on the East Coast um, by 2025 and over at their West Coast boot camp in San Diego by 2028. And so February of this year, the Marine Corps began integrated training uh, over in San Diego. So, um, you know, the rest of the story is that my client was my wife. Uh, we were both in the Marine Corps uh, at the same time, and, uh, and she was a lieutenant colonel uh, down at 4th Battalion, shaking things up. Um, but since then, you know, I've also helped other clients uh, gain their reputations back by working with the media. So I had a, a colonel um, contact me this spring who was falsely uh, or was fired under illegitimate reasons. So despite you know being fired by a three star, he um, he went through the process and and was cleared by the the Department of the Navy. But these pesky articles uh, talking about his relief from command were still out there, and so I was help I helped him kind of navigate that and either get updated stories printed in the press uh, that he was exonerated or completely removed and de-indexed from the internet. So that that's another technique we could talk about if anyone's interested and how to do that. But I'll stop there, Jackie. I don't want to talk too much and I want to leave uh, time for Heidi to Heidi to speak as well. So. Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad Heidi was able to join us. Um, Heidi is also a, a board member of Whistleblowers of America. So I rely on Heidi a lot for a lot of uh, advice, knowledge, and, and to be my peer support. <laughs> <laughs> so Heidi, why don't you give us a, a quick introduction and overview and then I was going to start with you and ask you what it was like to be on, on CBS. Well, hello. Can everybody hear me? Hopefully. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Um, Jackie is right. She is my friend as well as we're, she's my whistle sister, just like Jane is. Um, and uh, we, we've been on a journey together. I mean, we've, we've, all of us have done some moving and some shaking, I think. Um, at least that's what we're trying to do, right? Um, I was a higher ed whistleblower. I was a college dean in a for-profit college that spanned five different states. Um, I originally came from Podunk, South Dakota, you know, this little tiny town in South Dakota, Baltic. Um, and so I had a 
you know, rose up the ranks kind of fast. And I was a medical assistant, a practicing medical assistant for several, excuse me, several years and uh, started teaching. And so, and I loved it. It was great. Um, started seeing a lot of fraud, a lot of really bad stuff, lying to students, uh, lying about credits, accreditation, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, I think everybody knows the the whole for-profit commercials when they're on TV, that the height of everything. Um, and so I had to make a tough decision on whether, you know, I was going to speak up or think about speaking up or give up my job. And I just moved my family. I was the sole breadwinner at the time. And uh, my dad died of cancer right about that time. And the school made me leave my dad's funeral to go to an accreditation conference. And I sat there and thought that's the longest day of my life. It really was, it truly was the longest day of my life. I was stuck in an Atlanta airport and uh, just got a revelation thanks to a stranger that stopped by. Um, and decided to become a whistleblower. So long story short, that's my story. Um, I went through a seven day jury trial. I was lucky enough, I say that lightly, I was lucky enough to go through a seven day jury trial because most whistleblowers don't get their day in court. And so um, I, I was privileged. Everybody says, oh my gosh, how, was, how horrible was that? Yeah, it was horrible, but I was lucky because most people don't get that opportunity. And so the jury was unanimous, my favor, and, and long story short, here I am. Um, when I got, when the trial was over, I wanted to get away from whistleblowing. I, I never wanted to hear that word ever again. I didn't want to, I didn't want to be one. I, I wanted to just pack that away and just go on with my life like I was before. Wrong. Doesn't happen that way. <laughs> so I decided to embrace it. So then I thought, you know, what can I do with this? Because obviously I'm being blackballed. You know, they say that that never happens. Well, it does. So um, I could not get a job in academia and I have stellar credentials. So um, I decided to do some other advocacy and education in other ways. And I, I spoke to the lovely Jackie Garrick. Uh, I reached out to her and met her for the first time. And you know what? That first day, I think we talked for like an hour and we're talking about all kinds of different, oh, you know, we should do a certification. That would be a great thing. Blah, 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 you know, all these ideas. Um, and then CBS got a hold of my attorney. Um, CBS Whistleblower was a show uh, produced by Alex Ferrar, uh, Judge Alex, if anybody rem remembers him or knows him, which super nice guy, really nice guy. And Ted Eccles. Uh, they're the executive producers, and they wanted to uh, showcase whistleblowers, at least in the light that most people don't know how many whistleblowers there are. You know, they know, if, you know, your Aaron Brockovich and, you know, uh, famous names, but there are hundreds, hundreds of us. Hopefully after this conference, there'll be thousands of us. That's what I say anyway, but... Um, and they said they really liked my story because it was unique because most whistleblowers, like I say, don't get to go through trials. So uh, they got a hold of me. We, we had this whirlwind. They came to my house and, and recorded here. I had a producer that was just for my segment. Um, it was crazy, um, really, but fun. I thought it, I always thought it was going to be scary. And as a whistleblower, I don't trust anybody. I don't, I'm sure other whistleblowers will agree with me when I say this, that Trust doesn't come easy for most of us after we've been through what we've been through. Um, and it's, so it's hard for me to put myself out there. So, um, and I think they had got, found that out with other whistleblowers that uh, it was difficult for them to, to, you know, that we already feel exposed the way it is. So long story short, I had to go to New York then and film the rest. I mean, we did probably 10 hours of filming for a half hour of the show. Um, and then my show was the season finale. My, my story was they used for the season finale. And so I was honored. It had great ratings, I guess. I got a lot of really great emails from people, supportive. It was good. Um, and then they hired me for season two to be an associate producer and, and um, try to find me a place that I could still be on on camera and still try and share. Maybe like a we were trying to come up with a whistleblower reporter, like an, a correspondent type thing. Um, but all the stuff there's a lot of 
sh shenanigans going on at CVS at that time, so it didn't pan out. I'll just say shenanigans. Well, we all know what's going on. Anyway, um, there's a lot of changes going on. So uh, they hired me as associate producer. I was fortunate enough to be able to find whistleblower stories for season two. So many of the stories for that you see in season two of whistleblower were people that I found. And how did I find them? I cold called them. I said, hey, do you have any stories? Do you have any whistleblowers that I can meet? And it worked because I'm a whistleblower and so it was easier to reach other whistleblowers, I think, the whole trust thing. So that's the world when the gist of it. Uh, we were gonna go into season three, but it got uh, put on hiatus. And uh, it's like, uh, yeah, permanently on hiatus right now. I think there's a lot of little political shenanigans again, we'll call it that, that uh, play into a lot of that, but great people, great. It was, you know, they were not what my idea of the press or journalism would be. They were all very, very nice people, very good, and very pro-whistleblower, very, very much so. No, thank you for sharing that. Uh, it sounds like it's been a whirlwind of an experience. Um, so, and Jane, you, 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 as you mentioned, you write the whistleblower stories each week. I found it really interesting that you um, start with their childhood and that, uh, that chronology. Why do you start there? Uh, you're talking about my childhood and, oh, now their childhood. You, yes, yes, when you write your stories, you, uh, you always seem to include that where they grew up and their background yes. and their childhood. Why do you think that's important to start with that element of the story? Uh, I like to, I was a, a profiler in the FBI and I find it extremely fascinating what makes a whistleblower because they are different. I will say that uh, and they should be very proud of that. They tend to be outside the box that allows them to blow the whistle. Um, it is a very tough thing to do. And most of them are blowing the whistle just because they're trying to right a wrong. They're just doing their job, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't even think of themselves as whistleblowers. So I like to get into what formed them, what is in the pedestal that uh, holds them up, that makes them unique and special, because they are unique and special. And that's why I call them heroes, because they are heroes. heroes they step outside the box and do something very few people would do. And I think the reading public is very interested in that. Mm -hmm. They wonder what makes this person be able to do that? Something I cannot do. Uh, the majority of the public cannot do that, blow the whistle. They just don't have it, you know? No, I would agree. I just thought it was always interesting that you start the story and incorporate that element because I think that is what shapes the um, propensity to be a whistleblower and what gives you that background and that grit to, to really take an experience and move it forward and then have um, the wherewithal to tell it to a reporter. I remember the first time I talked to a reporter I was so nervous and I was so scared. I was like trying to find a, a hiding place under the stairs, <laughs> under a tree. I didn't want anybody to see me or know, like, like it just, they would know that they, somebody saw me on the phone, they would know who I was talking to. I was so scared to talk to a reporter the first time. Um, so Joe, I'm gonna kind of dive right in here with you though. So what's a press release and what makes one a good press release? How do you get the media's attention? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And I think, um, you know, a good press release is one that gets a bunch of reporters to call you to talk about your story, right? Um, you, you know, I, I think a lot of times uh, people kind of put the, the, the tactics before the strategy. Uh, but, you know, I think it really is just uh, amounts to being in, intentional. Like what, what effect do you want to have in mind with, with the communication uh, tool that you use uh, in terms of who's my audience and what do I want them to think, feel, or do at the, at the end of, um, interacting with that information. So, um, but, you know, I think uh, there's a tremendous amount of tools available these days, whistleblowers, especially, you know, with the advent of social media and now that there's no gatekeepers to the media anymore. And, um, you know, but, but I think one of the things I love about the press is that if, if you get a good reporter interested in your story, um, the megaphone intensifies and you don't have to build that organic audience. 
Um, so instead of trying to build the mountain, um, you just go to it and uh, and then speak from that mountain top. Um, and I think, you know, it's it's important to kind of understand the difference between like how print, radio, and uh, TV all works as well. Because what what I found in my experience, I've been working with the press for about 20, 25 years. And uh, I find that radio and TV being broadcast media is more like Twitter. It's like what's happening right now, and you're going to get short bursts of like, you know, the like kind of wave top information. Uh, but unless it's a program like 60 Minutes or something that's really devoted and, and invested, um, uh, it's, it's hard for them to really tell uh, in-depth stories, especially complicated in-depth stories. Yeah. Uh, what I also find is that print folks tend to be a little bit more methodical, and you'll get, you know, somewhere between six, eight, 1,200 words out of them um, if you can convince them to tell your story initially. And uh, they're going to pick up on more of the nuance, right? And you're going to get a reading audience instead of a watching audience, which tends to be a little different cut of a, cut of a person. And, uh, and then there's also like investigative journalism. And these are the folks that that's pretty much their forte is, is diving deep on issues and, and holding the powerful accountable. And, and they'll do, you know, sometimes more than 300 or 3,000, 4,000 words on an article if, um, if they can really break it open. And, and uh, we, we could talk a little bit later if you like about like who, you know, where to go for those resources and where to find those folks as well. So I'll stop there. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I think you're right. So those were, those are definitely questions on, on the table that I have is um, how do you identify and connect with the right reporter? So how do you sort of figure out like, so who will care about my story? Yeah. Um, and then, um, uh, and then, how do you know that you can trust them with your story? Yeah, and and that's important. I think you know the first time to meet a reporter, um, it, it's suboptimal when you meet them during a crisis. So you know we yeah. all have our own professions, whatever sector you're in, uh, and and most of us, if we're professional, we're reading articles and watching reports on on what's going on in our industry or our sector or government bureau or whatever. Um, and what I would advise people to do is pay attention to who's writing those stories, right? Because there's usually only a few reporters on any given beat. And once you recognize them, uh, who they are, uh, follow them on Twitter, you know, watch their, their feeds, um, and, uh, and reach out to them, right? You know, be, even before you have a, a story to tell, it's always good to make relations, uh, solid relationships with reporters before you have a crisis, uh, which isn't always the easiest thing for most people to do, but if, if you find yourself in the middle of one, um, seek out people who work with the media and leverage their context, right? Because then you're going to be entering that relationship with a much higher level of trust uh, than you would otherwise. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like find your friends who work with the press and, and, uh, and ask them. <laughs> no, I, I agree. And because my story was related to um, what I felt were conflicts of interest with suicide prevention funds in the, at the Pentagon. Um, the reporters that wrote about me the most were from the military community. Um, some other outlets who were interested then in fraud, waste, and abuse, but it was finding that right niche and finding um, the right, the, you know, sort of that right genre. And I mean, I work with a lot of reporters all the time pitching stories, and I'll throw a lot of pitches. I won't get a lot of hits because that's, I think that's part of it too, is just knowing to be patient with that. I mean, like Heidi was saying earlier, she was cold calling people, just going, hey, you're a whistleblower, would you wanna be in the news? Hey, you're a whistleblower, do you wanna be in the news? I, I, I see that more in reverse. Um, although I will get a lot of reporters that will say to me, hey, I'm doing a COVID story, what you got? I'm doing a story about the military, what you got? You know, they're looking, they know we might have leads as, as an organization, at which point I can say, well, let me see what I can do. And then, you know, if there is a connection to be made, I can do that. Um, but when you can't find a reporter, I, I know there are, we were talking about social media earlier. Um, so do I, uh, any of you have advice on whether or not you self-publish? I don't know, Heidi, if you've ever self-published anything. Jane, if you've self-published, do you tell your own story in the press? And if you do, how do you do that? I mean, I think I can probably take that a little bit. Um, you don't, as Jackie says, uh, you don't always get a hit. Uh, I think keeping, I, you know, Joe hit on it too, keeping your everything short, uh, attention grabbing is important. 
Um, but sometimes, you know, no matter what you say, it's just not going to get picked up. And so um, there are several underground publishing, and which is big with the millennial generation. I mean, they, they get all of their resources from several different underground media sources and not mainstream media. Um, so it's generational that way. Uh, the, um, I do a podcast, um, you know, Jane publishes every week through um, social media and does a lot. Jane's a big tweeter. She's a tweeter, tweeter, tweeter in the middle of the night even. She tweets 24-7 over there. She's and Jane and I only live like maybe 20 miles away from each other. We're, I'm coming over for dinner tonight, Jane. Um, <laughs> no, right, right. So, you know, you have to be open-minded to new technology, and, and sometimes it's hard when you're old like me, and you know, like try and embrace all this stuff. But I think Joe's talking about organic versus not organic, um, and so sometimes the media, for whatever reason, you know, they just are not going to pick up whatever you're laying down, and so you do have to come up with alternative. Um, resources and publishing a podcast is a great way to do that and a great way to get out there and get heard too so Heidi you started your own podcast what did you do that and what resources or what did you need to do to start a podcast um I read a lot and then I then I tried to share with Jane and teach her and so we're but no I literally I had no idea how to do any of that and CBS the executive producer Ted Eccles said, you know, until we get this figured out, Heidi, what we're doing with you, um, why don't you try doing a podcast? I'm like, sure, no problem, that'll be easy, I'll do no, no problem. I'm a whistleblower, right? I can figure it out. So, oh my gosh, there's so much to do. You have to get a host and all this other stuff. But it really, if you find the right podcaster uh, hosting platform, it does make it a little bit easier. And there are several free resources. So if anybody wants to hit me up, I can you can actually do a podcast for free. Um, you, <laughs> so it's possible. Whether anybody listens to it, I don't know. But um, I do, a, my podcast is called The Whistleblower Revolution. And I I get to in-person interview uh, not only whistleblowers, but their attorneys. Because mm -hmm. I think the attorneys really have a lot of stories to share too. Okay. They're very important. So, so I've been lucky enough to do that. So yeah, um, hit me up. I'll, I'll put some links up too and show you how to at least get your feet wet if you ever want to do that yeah no so oh, i i just your, your, your oh, I, I, look, I just wanted to say hold on Joe, one sec sure. i just wanted to say that um paul pearson has been putting your links for your podcast and some of your resources in the chat so if anybody um wants to find any of that um just keep scrolling and, and paul is uploading information uh, that Heidi has shared and Jane. So so Joe, go ahead. Yeah, just two, two points to follow on with what Heidi said. She identified some important stuff. I just want to uh, really, really reemphasize like Twitter is awesome for talking to reporters. Um, you know, that's where they all kind of live and hang out. And anytime I've wanted to slip things into, you know, the, the media digestive track, that's the place I've gone to. And Facebook is where you build your supporter army, like your friends and family. And, and, and when when Kate ran into, into trouble with the Marine Corps, uh, we beat them to the press, right? We, we broke the story first and told our story to a trusted reporter who uh, was at the San Diego Union Tribune at the time, who had been following the whole women in, um, in the ground combat arms story and had been getting jerked around by the Marine Corps and was pretty frustrated. So, um, but I had known her for, for a number of years and worked together. So getting to the press first is everything, I think, mm -hmm. because when you can frame your story and be the first to speak, uh, you have a tremendous advantage because all, from that point on, we had, we had the Marine Corps on its heels and we were driving the tempo uh, despite their efforts to malign her. They were breaking their own policy by you know, throwing their, their sham investigation out to the press. Um, they were contacting reporters and, and maligning her to the point where reporters were calling me and being like, hey, I just want to give you a heads up. Like, you know, the Marine Corps Public Affairs contacted me and this is what they were saying about you and your wife. And I'm like, wow. So, um, and, uh, but we built a social media army. So like every time a report came out, uh, we would notify our list of, of trusted people and they would crash the comment section of every single article <laughs> and, and, and put their thoughts in there first. Um, so that, you know, if somebody's reading the article, they get down to the comments. And there were five or six supportive comments, you know, just um, 
uh, questioning the Marine Corps' position in every single one of them, right? So having that was tremendously powerful in, in shaping the narrative and, and making sure that, um, you know, we got her side of the story out because the Marine Corps has got unlimited resources and a tremendous, tremendous PR arm, but what they don't have is they have a bureaucracy too. So as a whistleblower, uh, we were able to run a guerrilla campaign much faster and, and make <laughs> decisions, kind of get in that, in that decision loop a, a lot faster than, than they could. They couldn't keep up. Now that's, I think that's uh, some great points. And we did have a question from the audience um, asking, have you ever seen where the defendant may influence a story yeah. about the whistleblower during litigation to attack the credibility of the whistleblower? <laughs> so that looks like a lot of head nodding. I think, Joe, that's just kind of what you were talking about. Precisely, yeah. So, um, so I, and it sounds like you're using, you've used social media to get ahead of that. You mentioned something earlier, though, about how do you, how do you clean up the negative um, yeah. publicity about you? Yeah, so um, th there's two different ways. I had a, a colonel who's wrongfully terminated from his command, and he was able to demonstrate that to mm -hmm. the Secretary of the Navy's, you know, um, adjudication council process. And so I was able to take that and go back to the editors um, of where these stories were published and have conversations with them about like, uh, hey, you printed this at the time. Uh, that was all factually correct at the time because this was the action that the institution took. Uh, but what you need to know is the rest of the story. So we would like you to either update the story and uh, and let the world know um, that that this person was cleared and go back to the original stories and link to the new one and put a note up front saying that this this, you know, the, the more truth on the matter has come out. Right. Um, or completely remove it. Right. And so what they'll do is a process called de-indexing where the story will will typically still live on their website. It's an archival thing, but they'll de-index it from the search engines. And uh, unless you had that exact URL, you're never going to find it. So it won't come up uh, in that. So he had he had three articles that were um, all talking about his relief. And uh, we had two updates and one de-index. So, I, you know, he was, my client was pretty, pretty happy with that. So, was, you know, because every time somebody would Google him for a, a job interview or, you know, a public speaking event or whatever, these things would come up. Um, and the other thing you can do is work on search engine optimization, where if you publish and print uh, opinion pieces and things under your pen, um, the older material will get driven down. So if you can get that down to the fifth or sixth, um, kind of like the negative stories to the fifth or sixth uh, thing on Google, uh, on the search results, or even get it pushed down to the next page, then you're, you're awesome. Because uh, most people won't bother to click to the next page. So, yeah. <laughs> No, that's, uh, I think that is uh, very good advice. Um, so what does it mean? So if you're engaging with a, a more formal reporter like a, C a CBS Evening News or CNN or, you know, the Washington Post, what does it mean to be on background, off the record? How do you know how to set up the rules of engagement before you give somebody your story? Joe, you look like Joe, Heidi, Jane, somebody. Um, I, I was interviewed by HBO Vice, um, who came out here. Our little town just got a big infusion. And um, and as, a, you know, a couple of other bigger, a CNN. Um, and I can tell you that you have to make the boundaries crystal clear before you open your mouth for anything. Um, and that includes, you know, signing, you know, they're going to have you sign the disclosure, you know, saying that you're, you're giving your story, you know, and they're able to use it and that sort of thing. But you have to make the boundaries crystal clear. If you do not, if your attorney is telling you not to talk about something, which several cases are under seal for a long time, and they're not able to talk about anything at all, not even the attorney. So uh, my case, for, for, for fortunately was public the whole way through four years so I got I got beat up pretty bad um, by the defendant the school uh, thank goodness the society was pretty decent you know I, I didn't get that that way but you um, otherwise you know they don't know they people reporters are not out to get you they're not out to make the story be you have be a villain as a whistleblower Typically, society looks at whistleblowers in a positive light, and so the reporters want to—they want this to be a feel-good story out there. But you know, you gotta—if there's something you're uncomfortable talking about, don't talk about it. 
make it clear. Ask your attorney those sorts of things first. Joe, do you have anything? Yeah, it, Jane? it all has to do with, those three terms have to do with attribution. Mm -hmm. And and so, again, yeah, I can't can't agree uh, strongly enough with Heidi, like before you even talk, uh, make sure that you know the terms of attribution. So one thing that we did with, with Kate, uh, because she was still on active duty and still subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice, is that when we would talk to reporters, I would say, I would set it up. So like, say, okay, we're gonna talk off the record first. And then from this conversation, we just wanna have a frank and robust conversation. Um, and off the record means nothing, none of that information can be used or printed, right? But it's for kind of like the reporter's education. And, um, and I said, from that conversation, you let me know what you want to use from these interviews and we'll, we'll talk about that, right, um, going forward. And then we would approve individual quotes that could, could come out just to make sure she steer, steered clear of any hot water. Um, on background means that you, the information can be reported, but you can't be identified by name. And so that's where you'll read a news report and it will say like a Department of Defense official who is not authorized to speak um, gave this information. And that, that, that kind of thing is on background. So it's you know, it's, it's a, somebody that's known to the reporter, they've been vetted and validated. The information, you know, is typically gonna get checked against a second source and then um, a second or third source and uh, for verification. And they'll probably even call the organization and be like, hey, did this happen? Um, you know, to see what their response would be as well. Uh, and then on the record is everything you say can be used with your name attached to it. So then it would be Joe Plunzler, you know, a, a former Marine, Colonel said this, that, or the other thing. Well, Lieutenant Colonel said this. Um, so it all has to do with attribution. On the record, your name is, is there. On background, you're, you're generalized. And then off the record, can't be used at all. So. And sir, what are the pros and cons to that? What's the advantage of either staying on background or you know, really putting your name out in front of the press? Yeah, I think it depends on what, what strategy you want to employ. Um, you know, it's, it's if... Uh, if it's helpful to the case, like if, if your risk gain calculation is, is such that um, this issue really needs a champion and, and you're in the position where unfortunately you're going you're gonna to be the face of that, that issue and champion the issue, uh, then you probably want to be on the record, right? Because for most of it, right? um, if there's things that, that um, are super sensitive and you can't have your name uh, attached to it, um, but you want it to come out, then you probably want it on background. And uh, if it if it can't come out, but but somebody needs to know the truth, and you don't want your name attached to it, and it shouldn't be printed, then then that's off the record, right? So, and there's times, and, and government officials do this all the time too. I mean, I've <clears throat> had four star generals take reporters into classified briefings, you know, to give them better context and information on on what uh, was going on operationally. But they were the classification authority and were able to do that. But if you're dealing with uh, classified information, you really need to talk to a lawyer and tread very, very carefully because um, yeah. you could go to jail for that. I mean, that's really bad. So. <laughs> yes, or end up in Russia. <laughs> yeah. yeah mm -hmm. So, so Jane, when you when you talk to somebody for the first time, um, what do you usually sense that, that that is the most important thing to them in telling their story? And how do you encourage them to really... Um, focus on the important things and not just get stuck in the minutia? Well, as you well know, um, I think that it's important to let them speak. So oftentimes uh, we will get into the minutia, but that's okay. It, it, it's important that a whistleblower be allowed to tell their story and however long it takes. Uh, I've been on the phone with a whistleblower for hours and that's okay. Um, because that's all part of the process of unburdening kind of the trauma, which uh, on every one of these whistleblowers, there's trauma. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to mention something uh, speaking to the press. I have been doing this for so long that I tend to have no filters. So uh, like Rolling Stone, when I talk to them, of course, their lead on their article was the FBI doesn't give a shit. And uh, I don't know if that was good or bad, but that was my feeling and I put it right out there. And so that's what Rolling Stone published. And uh, I have never talked to uh, a news person uh, and, and said, don't say I said this, mainly because um, I think as a whistleblower, you really have to show people 
that you're not afraid. You just are not afraid. They've thrown their best at you. You survived. There is life after whistleblowing, and you're not afraid. Totally. You take their power away by doing this. Yes. Yeah. So what about liability for what you say? Um, could they turn around and sue you for saying bad things about them? Um, I, I think that they probably could if what I said was untrue. But uh, when Rolling Stone called me about the FBI mishandling the Nassar case and asking me why they mishandled it, of course, the answer is they don't give a shit about crimes against children <laughs> cases. And so, yeah, come and sue me because I have uh, plenty of proof that that is true. Mm -hmm. And in case, uh, in this case, in fact, Senator Grassley's office got a hold of me and, you know, wants some questions uh, that pertain to the FBI and their mishandling of crimes against children cases. So yeah, I feel very comfortable in just putting it out there. And if they want to come after me, hey, they've done enough damage that they can't damage me anymore. That's the way I feel about it. Mm -hmm. Throw me in jail. Hopefully I'll end up with Sowers or uh, Dr. Sowers <laughs> or uh, there's several whistleblowers in jail. Hopefully uh, one of you will be next door to me. <laughs> well, thank you for that. <laughs> um, so I don't know if any of you know about, um, so when I think about uh, whistleblowers trying to get their story out, and Joe, you mentioned the investigative reports. I mean, I've worked, I once worked two years with a reporter who then got threatened to be sued if he published the story. And so they didn't publish the story. Him nor the paper wanted to move forward after spending all that time. I mean, it was hours, and as Heidi mentioned, you know, you film for 10 hours for a 30 minute story. So a lot goes into the background of this. Um, how do you how do you maybe help fund a story or find the resources? to get a story out there, even when there is so much at stake. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the major news organizations, in my experience, like when people start threatening to sue them for publishing the story, then they know they really got something. And you know, they'll, they'll lawyer up, they'll have their folks, you know, fact check everything, and then that thing's gonna go, right? Because uh, especially if it's an exclusive, um, you know, and they wanna get that out, because that's gonna sell a lot of newspapers. Uh, but, you know, the places I, I, I recommend going to is like the Center for Investigative Reporting uh, does a lot of good work. ProPublica is tremendous. Yeah. Um, they're, they're so wonderful um, and, and have broken so many important stories over the years. Um, you know, I've been mostly focused on, on VA type work and, and reporters like Isaac Arnsdorf over at ProPublica. There's a young guy named Jasper Craven who yeah. does a lot of freelance stuff who's tremendous. Um, you know, they're, they're invested and they care about these issues and they want to hold, you know, the powerful to account. So, um, and then the National Press Club, they have a journalism institute over there and uh, they can, you know, help direct you into uh, a reporter who, who's probably would be interested in, in your story. Um, and then also, um, don't forget about the journalism schools, right? Because they have centers for investigative journalism and, um, and they have a bunch of young people who, uh, who need <laughs> need to do stories for, for classwork and master's degrees and things like that. So, um, you know, Medill, Columbia, there's a lot of, of, of universities that, that may be interested in picking up the slack if you've got something good and you just can't seem to get any working reporter uh, on the issue. But uh, those are places where I would go uh, to, to get some, some, uh, some help. No, I, I appreciate those were really good resources um, to make note of. And I think those are you know, when people are really investigating how to tell their story, I yeah. think we do need to, to be mindful. I see somebody put in the chat information about um, being sued after, I guess, yeah. putting a letter together. And I mean, that's what happened to the, the Roosevelt commander, right? He sent an email and the person he sent an email sent it to the media and, you know, it, it spun out of control for him. So I do think, you know, it's, 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 there are some things I think we do need to be mindful of that, um, you know, that there are dangers out there and there are dangerous people out there who, when you go to the press, will come after you. Sure. Um, 
I think there are there there are some real real issues to have a plan and be ready for. And you know, Jane said, "Well, come after me for telling the truth. I have my facts. Yeah. Just sort of be ready to know what your what is fact versus your opinion." Um, I have a, an attorney who's on our board who's probably listening to this right now, who always is who always is telling me just stick to the facts not your yeah. opinion and you'll be okay as long right. as it's the truth the truth is not illegal <laughs> no but it is the number one defense to libel and slander is if it's true mm -hmm. it's not libel or slander so i mean that, that's, that doesn't constitute legal advice and you consult your attorney <laughs> but uh you know what um yes you know, that's exactly what they taught us in uh in grad school so yeah yeah and you have to determine your your risk factor um yeah. what kind of risk are you willing to take uh, that's very important. You have to decide that. Yep. Well, I think it's important, like you say, you know, with legal advice, consult an attorney. I tell, you know, I sound like a, I'm a, a an attorney spokesperson. What do they say that on TV? Whatever. I sound like one, but I'm. I really mean it. You, it, you have a dog in the fight when you have an attorney, and you're kind of floundering. There, there are a few whistleblowers that get a hold of me that are they're willy nilly talking to the press and going all over, and they don't even have an attorney yet. So it's it can really wreck your case and and hurt you yeah. legally. Yeah, and, and you know the the tough the tough calls are when your attorney saying one thing and the PR person saying one thing, you know, a different thing because. One's trying to win the court case. The other one's trying to win the court of public opinion. So, you know, it's uh, mm -hmm. there's, there's all sorts of calculations. Hopefully you can sit them both down and, and, and have them come <laughs> to agreement on the strategy. That's that's the best course of action. So uh, there was a question that came up about um, is there a better a better or more appropriate term for the word whistleblower? Um, I know I have people tell me all the time I hate that damn stupid whistle. Um, so how do we fight the stigma against whistleblowing? I mean, I think we've mentioned rat, snitch, tattletale. Um, those are the uh, devil, <laughs> bounty hunter. I, I mean, I've had people tell me there are all kinds of negative terminology used for whistleblowing. How can we get the media to help change that and use terms like truth teller, lamplighter, ethicist, relator, protectionist? I mean, I'm throwing out some of the ones I've used how do we how do we address that stigma? Okay, so Jane, you're you're on the you're on the forefront, I think, with this. You're on mute. I will have to say that whistleblower uh, twenty years ago was not a good <laughs> term, and in the last twenty years, it has really turned around, and uh, I think that's important now. I saw uh, where they used the term in uh, the state that voted against abortion, Texas, that they want whistleblowers to call and, and uh, snitch on women who are looking at abortion. And I hated to see them use that term because we have fought so long to make that term one about warriors and heroes. And I think that it's slowly coming along. And we just did a poll, uh, the Whistleblower Network News, that showed that 85% of the American public supports whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. So I, I really think that from 20 years ago, things have really turned around. I'll have to hear from the rest of the panelists what they think, but I do believe it has turned around. Okay, well, that's good to hear. Heidi, Joe? Um, go ahead, Joe. No, I would agree with with Jane. I think, uh, you, you know, when I hear the term, I don't have a, a negative reaction. That's just me personally. But I think um, truth telling. Yeah, I think that's a great, great way to to um, to, to a great term to use. And I, I think, you know, we just keep on using the terms that that cast it in a positive light and change is hard and it takes a long time. But, you know, sooner or later you get there if you're persistent. Right. Well, and I think one of the reasons we decided to call it the Giraffe Award tonight was because we love, that's going to be our, that's like our mascot, that's the, the giraffe behind me. I got my little giraffe pin on. Um, <laughs> we've nicknamed ourselves the Giraffery because giraffes stand tall and stick their necks out in spite of risking the criticism. So. <laughs> I like it. I like you know, what, what if we, what if we embrace the word snitch? 
You know, I, I look at it in a different way. I really do, because there are certain groups, um, like look at the, the, you know, the gay community, for instance. They, they embrace the word queen. You know, that used to be a negative term for them. And look at, you know, they turned a negative into a positive. So, you know, somebody says you're a snitch. Yeah, well, okay, if that's where we're going with it, then yep, that's what I'm doing. But you have to understand in order to snitch, somebody's got to be telling the truth about some bad stuff somewhere else. So, you know, if you explain that to people, they go, oh, well, yeah, I guess so, you know. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think Jane is correct. Whistleblower has become a more positive term because of the times. Uh, I, you know, I think that kind of moves with whatever's going on politically in the country as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, either, any of them, I, I'm down with it. Tattletale, blabbermouth, yeah, there's all kinds of ones. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that. Uh, it's, it, there's a schooling then that needs to happen after somebody might might try to say, oh, you're just being a snitch or a tattletale. Well, yeah, because you're doing something wrong. And my mom would have raised me to be that way. <laughs> um, so I recognize that we are just about out of time for this panel, because I'm supposed to uh, let everybody take a break. Um, we are plowing through. These are lots of hours and long days to get through. So I have really, truly appreciated um, chatting with all of you. I feel like I could have done this just all day because I, I love y'all. You're so great. And um, But we've got more to come and more great fun people to talk to in the, the sessions that are coming up at 345. We will come back and start talking about resilience and surviving whistleblowing and building that new normal. We, we sort of started that conversation during the last panel. So I'm going to let everybody go have a, a bio break. And um, thank you so much, Heidi, Jane, Joe. My my great show, my great thanks to you to you for for being here today. Oh, you I know you're all very busy. Thank, thank you, Jackie. You. And I hope this is the start of many, many more. I hope this is the foundation that uh, will cause a lot of change and will go on from here for many, many years. Thank you, my whistle sister. See you later. Bye, Bye Heidi. Bye. 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 Bye, Jackie. Bye. Thank you.